Some of the work that we're going to be presenting today, talking about some of the secrets of our solar system, looking back and asking the question of, well, were there ancient civilizations outside of Earth? You know, where could Mars have play a role in this whole story? And so, so some of this research that we're going to be talking about today, Billy and I are planning on expanding on and putting into some of the work that we're going to be doing in the future. Um, and I, as a lot of people know, I'm a researcher that that does a lot of work with ancient history on Earth and talking about cuneiform tablets. But today we're trying to try to expand on those things and, and trying to connect them with things like the Enuma Elish and then going into some of these anomalies in our solar system and really look into the past and some of the evidence of, well, was is there a lot more that we're not being told about our solar system and the, the universe itself? So guys, today we're really gonna be covering a whole bunch of different topics. We're gonna go all over the place looking at everything from uh, the micro to the macro, really looking at um, you know the, the vast cosmos all the way down to on a small level. And I, as always, I like to start with a higher level because these discussions that talk about topics that are outside the mainstream and really make you have to peel back those layers of conditioning to then objectively look at things and then start asking those difficult questions. Because like a lot of others on this show will know, there's a lot of things that we've haven't been told the truth about a lot of things that are deceptive so to get th to get things the ball rolling here i want to start right off by putting us at a certain higher level perspective now billy i want to share my perspective about something that i think a lot of people constantly um make comments about and i think it'd be good for us to set the stage uh correctly with our understanding at least of right. Right. the nature of our reality in our universe now many have keep coming to me saying that you know they think space is all fake because of these ancient terms like um, third dimensional plane and ha because of has NASA has lied to s about so much about our uh, our solar system and about the truth of what uh, what is out there with sentient life. So Billy, give me your perspective on how you see the vast cosmos and you know habitable worlds and where we fit into this in this vast universe. There's unfortunately there's a a lot of propaganda um, going around, uh, going on around the world, literally, not just in America, it's around the world. Uh, we're talking about the shape of the planet and the, the space doesn't exist and things like that. <clears throat> I think that it's really important for us to continue to educate people because what's happened is a lot of the information has been skewed or different agendas have been pushed forward and a lot of false information as well has been pushed forward that is unfortunately uh, allowing people that are really have a lot of zest and zeal for trying to expose the truth to go down a path that actually isn't correct. Uh, we are living in a real universe. The universe, when I say real, it's a to me, it's a holographic matrix, which gets deep into quantum physics. The matrix aspect of it describes mathematically and scientifically how this realm is created. Uh, so I go. That's why I like to talk. I like to talk a lot about the double slit experiment. I like to talk about a lot about wave particle duality in physics and quantum physics and quantum mechanics. I like to talk about the underlying basis of reality and how it works, and to build up this this construct, this energetic grid that we're all plugged into and living on. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, from the perspective of being fully immersed in the dimension of the third dimension. Uh, we truly are living in something that is an amazing and beautiful creation that does have space and oxygen and other gases as well. We don't just breathe in oxygen, by the way. You breathe in oxygen, nitrogen, helium, krypton, many other gases. We only breathe in 21% oxygen. A lot of people aren't aware of that. But um, we're breathing in gases. We're energizing these, uh, these cells in our body, which are just a, a microcosm of the macrocosm of the universe itself. 
Um, and we literally are the universe and the universe is inside of us. And when you really get down into studying physics and quantum physics, you'll begin to realize the synchronicities between the human avatar body and space itself. So I really do believe that we're living in a, a, in a real third dimensional universe, that the method of creation is holographic technology, uh, and that we do have a real spirit and a soul that is transmitted here from a higher dimension to animate these avatar bodies, uh, and that uh, we do have the capability of exploring space and beyond. And that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, well said, Billy. So in the ancient Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, Arjun, an ancient, um, an ancient king priest, is basically talking to Krishna, and he's having a discussion with Krishna, and he's trying to figure out the nature of reality in the universe. And he asks Krishna whether or not the physical world is real. And I think that's a question that many, many have talked about with, with all of this, these concepts of a holographic universe and the fact that things are really measured on a vibrational level. So he, he you know, Arjun talks, goes up, comes up to Krishna, this God figure, and he talks to him and he asks him, is the physical world real? I, when I look around me, the vast cosmos, is it there? And Krishna pauses for a moment and he answers, yes, the physical world is real. It's just simply a different state of matter. And I think that that's something we should really wrap our heads around and understand that, yes, things exist in, a, in an energetic form, but they also do exist in a physical form as well. I think it's like if you had layers on a cake and you tried to say that one of those layers didn't exist, well, that cake would just fall in on itself. There would be nothing to support it. Every, every dimension is part of how this reality is manifested and what goes into the bigger picture. So, yeah, I think... When we're looking out, and and by the way, this is a this is an image from the Hubble telescope, looking at just in in one direction, uh, out into our universe, which many many call and I call in my latest book more more of a multiverse because it seems like there's multiple versions of it all layered on top of each other. But the, these versions that we jump through and exist in, they are real. And so when you look in out into the the twinkle of a distant star, we have to wrap our heads around the fact that time and space exist in a level where that's that starlight may be millions to billions of years old just reaching your eyes at that one point but we're in so we're staring out into not only the moment in time that we're in but also looking back in time it's so it's incredible to stare out into that vast cosmos and i really just feel like not enough of people appreciate just where we're at you know some people come up and i talk to them they're like and I try to explain it about the universe and you know, where we are and have the vastness of the cosmos. And they're like, well, that's just not really my thing. And I, I almost, it's mind boggling to me that people can act like that, considering that we're just on the surface of a planet that's spinning through space thousands of miles an hour within our Milky Way galaxy. And so when we're surrounded by billions of other galaxies, um, Billy, I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Frank Drake in the Drake Equation, but essentially we're living on a world that is surrounded by billions of other yeah. like worlds. So, you know, what, what's out there, Billy? When I look out into space, um, I don't feel like I'm just this, you know, little tiny grain of sand and I I'm, have no meaning. I really now, based off of my research and understanding of what's happened in the ancient past, a lot of the research of science, and astrophysics and like the work of Drake and realizing that vast amount of advanced civilizations most likely exist out there beyond Earth. And most likely now, after doing a lot of work with the United Family of the of Anomaly Hunters the last uh, four years and five years, realizing that a lot of these space anomalies that we're seeing inside of our own solar system means that some of this life may not have been 20 billion light years away or 20 million light years away another star systems, but right here in our own solar system, right by our next door neighbors, we could be looking at planets and moons through our telescopes at home that potentially have had ancient civilizations. At least we can say they appear to look remnants of an ancient civilization. And some places, very oddly, Mars, which we'll talk about later on today, just strangely seems like there may be something there now in some way, shape or form. So it's very, very strange. These anomalies are unexplainable, but they're also undeniable, which is what I like. The fact that anybody can look these up, not just us. You don't have to be an expert. The links are always provided to the content we push out with these space anomalies. And it just tells me that, man, we're part of something so big and so massive and so incredible 
It makes me feel bigger and stronger on the inside. It makes me feel like I'm part of something so special and that I'm very fortunate to be alive in this particular era of time of exploration through consciousness and also through the physical reality using technologies so that we can literally be the extension of consciousness reaching out to the universe to try to figure out more about who and what consciousness really truly is. Very well said, Billy. Um, and the, I think the other thing to expand on what you were saying, that having that perception of being in a vast cosmos that's constantly changing energetically and that the things that we do can ripple out and affect so many things beyond what we understand because the soul is non-physical and exists in higher dimensions. So we are like creator gods, like you and I talk about so much. But one thing I wanted, I wanted to bring up was this concept of, okay, so Frank Drake in the Drake equation postulates that with the amount of planets that, that have to exist within, you know, each different galaxy and each, um, each solar system, those, each star system, those planets, there has to at least be one in, 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 in almost every case that's in that Goldilocks zone where life can somehow develop. So therefore it would, it would make the most sense that there has to be countless sentient life that exists in the universe. So that's, th th there's our framework, our base for this. Now, so where are they all? That's that's that great question. I think the answer to that might be looking at things in a different way. Instead of looking at the universe in a, in a completely linear, linear way, like saying, for instance, okay, so the ancient Egyptians or the pre-dynastic pre Egyptians that built the pyramids, the land of Kemet, they worshipped the, the, the star of Sirius in Canis Major, and they worshipped Orion. So does that mean that they came from those places? Possibly. And if they did, though, how would they get here? Would they travel in a linear way? No, we're talking about millions of light years, millions. So then what's a more plausible scenario? And this is where I want to get your feedback, Billy. All across the ancient ancient world on our, on our own planet, on Earth, we find these very strange gateways. And this is something I briefly mentioned yesterday, um, two days ago in the, in the previous conference, talking about the ancient timeline. But we see these gateways all around the world in these ancient places, from Peru with Amaru Muru, all the way through Petra, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Nashi, Rostam, Persepolis, and Iran. All around the ancient world, we find these giant cliffs in mountains with these huge gateways that have been carved out using precise tools. And the gateways, in, in our own perception of them, they don't seem to lead anywhere. They're just rock walls. But yet, an enormous amount of work was put in to create these gateways. Do you think that these could be some kind of a Stargate portal? Uh, absolutely. I really do believe that, according to a lot of the indigenous people, <clears throat> these were um, gateways that had the capability of allowing the gods to walk from one planet to another and maybe even from one dimension to another. And as you stated so well, there are so many depictions of these gates all around the world. The Sumerians had one that they would, uh, you know, they call the Duranki, uh, where they said that they would literally, uh, and Lil uh, famously said he can walk from Earth to his home world and back. Uh, now, when I started analyzing a lot of the information from the ancient Egyptians, before it, even, before it was even called Egypt, when it was called the land of Kem, and you start analyzing some of the glyphs left behind, like the Jed Pillar Ankh, which a lot of people don't know about. It's an Ankh with a Jed Pillar installed in the top. This device that looks very reminiscent of a Tesla coil. Um, this particular device, the more you research it, you re realize that it's set to a specific frequency with a condenser in it that must resonate to the exact atomic frequency of the owner. Now, why is this important with stargates? Well, when you start realizing how these stargates work and looking into what's been left behind, giving us clues, it seems as if these ancient gods, which were these Anunnaki or Atlantean people, they could not walk through these gates at all these different places unless they had the Jed Pillar Unk in their hand. It was like the key to the actual gate. In other words, to keep the average person from just walking up and going through one of these stargates and ending up wherever they take them in the universe without approved access, only the elite of the elite would have the key. And the key had to resonate at a specific frequency to your subatomic vibrational frequency. And it had to, you had to have that thing in your hand. And uh, in order to walk through it, now the gate itself, in my terms, my conscious terms, would seem to have been probably programmed with your atomic frequency as well. So you match these atomic frequencies, you've got the key in your hand, 
and now you're able to walk through. I got some confirmation about this when I went to the Pyramid of Kukulcan in Tula, Mexico in 2016. And I got to climb the pyramid. I got to go inside. There was actually a place where Kukulcan, who was also known as Thoth, Hermes, Trismegistus, Tehuti, Tehuti, I mean, all the names he's got. Uh, but he came over there from Egypt and he built this pyramid. In back of the pyramid, there was a stargate that he would walk into. And according to my indigenous guide and archaeologist that went on the tour with us that took us out there, he would literally walk into that, that indention, which I took a great picture standing in front of, and he would literally vanish and he would end up somewhere else, either in another dimension or another planet or maybe even another, another part of the earth. Maybe he would come out in Petra, Jordan. Maybe he would come out in Peru. Uh, but it's really interesting that these gates are there. Uh, and I talked about what the most famous one to me is the K2 megalith crystal that was discovered underneath a tunnel by the Pyramid of the Sun in Bosnia in Europe. Now, there's a massive pyramid in Europe now well documented. It was covered purposefully by grass and trees and everything else. And an independent research company found it begin to uh, uncover it and found these massive stone blocks. And it's actually a pyramid valley. But this stone crystal that was located in the tunnel leading up to the pyramid of the sun there, it had an inscription on it written in something called runes, which was later translated. And it says, we must stand in battle in defense until we can go through the gate. And in my opinion, because Thoth talks about using these pyramids as stargate technologies, I really do believe that the Pyramid of the Sun may have had this same Stargate ability or Stargate technology, and that during that last Pyramid War, there seems to have been some type of massive battle at that location, uh, and it seems that these people were trying to reactivate the gate or go through the gate, or maybe allow their king or their god to escape while they battled. It's not really fully clear, but it seems to me that there's enough physical circumstantial evidence as well that says these gates really did exist. Well said, Billy. Now, I want to point out um, in the, the back of my latest book, The Stage of Time, on page 202, I have a god table. And Billy's talking about the Bosnian pyramids and some of these gateways. In, in Slavic, which is part of the Bosnian area, the Slavic gods that of Veles and Paran perfectly mimic the gods of Ea, Enki, and Enlil from Mesopotamia. Just like we find all around the world, um, from the Romans, Greeks, Persians, Akkadian, we find the same names. So when we see those god names that mimic in places like that, we know that that ancient technology and that ancient connection to this knowledge and these lost civilizations they were there. They were part of what seems like a very complicated and almost science fiction like history that occurred long ago before us. Now, I remember when I was a kid like probably many other others there that are listening to this. And I watched the movie Stargate, the original that came out. It completely blew my mind, unlike any movie I had probably ever seen in my lifetime. It was almost like there was this calling when I, when I saw that movie. Something stirred within me, and I remember just constantly wanting to watch it whenever I could. But it wasn't, wasn't in a way of just entertainment purposes. It seems like it was speaking to something much deeper within me that would awaken much, much later in my life. And so I sort of put it away to the side. You know, I, oh, I, you know, I love that movie, great. Put it away to the side and went on my life. And many, many, many years later, as I started to get into this research and I started looking at these doorways and all the stories about the ancient technology, th about gateways and going to some other location, and then learning about how far away these star systems were and how far, how long it would take just to travel to them. All of a sudden, it really started to make sense to me. You know, looking at Einstein's work where he, Einstein basically says in his work, he postulates looking at the, basically the matter and the energetic state of our reality that, yes, that wormholes have to exist somewhere. There has to be these gateway cut, cut, um, cut throughs between space. And that, I think that's the whole point of how you could get some kind of an advanced sentient being that could end up somewhere that it, it didn't start out in. I think that is the most plausible um, piece of evidence that I think that points that way. Now, so when I started to do that research, and I, I of course, remembered back on Stargate, and it's, it's remarkable how accurate some aspects of that movie are. So much so that, like many that know they, when they watch movies like The Matrix and many, many others, that they see so much of this symbolism and so much of this purposeful stuff that's been put in seeming like it's 
for, for those who are objective and are paying attention can be like a little breadcrumb to, to place there for them. But it, the point is, it can't be a coincidence. There had to, had to have been some kind of a pre-understanding of that type of technology and that legacy of the past to make something like that. So it begs the question, what happened to all of these gateways? You know, did that technology just become lost in these cataclysms? And over time, it was gone, and that's why they're the way they are? I think this this discussion leads us to the higher questions that go beyond just Earth. It goes towards, well, what is the ancient history of, yes, Earth, but what is the ancient history of our solar system? What's the history of Mars? Mars, if, for those who don't know, Mars is very unique in our solar system because it's the only other planet that could that could have supported life other than Earth because of its location within this within the vicinity of the sun. It was in many cases as lush, if not some have even estimated it could even be more lush than Earth at some point. So that begs the question, you know, what happened on in the past on Mars and what really what did Mars used to be like? Billy, have you seen yeah. Yeah. Any, any evidence or what is your thought process looking at Mars? Is there a chance that there could have been an ancient civilization that may even have been connected to Earth? Very good evidence that suggests that there has been an ancient civilization running concurrently with the civilization on Earth. And the civilization on Mars, in my opinion, seems to have been slightly more technologically advanced than the run running on Earth at the same exact time. And where I get this from is reading into the Enuma Elish and the Atreus epic and realizing that there were these working class Anunnaki beings mining uh, Mars for resources and using it as some type of a way station, whether it was for gold or whatever it was from, resources were getting brought up from Earth to that location and then transported to other planets in the in the, in, in the um, star system, and not only in our solar system, but even outside of our solar system. I think they were going out to other planets where they had orbited other suns. However, um, these are Gigi. The reason why I believe they were technologically more advanced, just two reasons. One is <clears throat> when you look at the images coming down from the NASA uh, servers and the European Space Agency servers, you look, we're looking at the Mars Global Surveyor images. We're looking at Viking, Opportunity Rover, Spirit Rover, Mars Curiosity rover. We're looking at all this data, and we've downloaded now well over a million images from the NASA and up close to 58,000 anomalies now that are well-documented anomalies that are shared upon a very small group of us to analyze with image experts and come up with the a yes or a no. Is this an anomaly or is this just something that appears to be part of the surrounding terrain? So we found 58,000 things out of a million that don't appear to be part of the surrounding terrain. And the things that we have found are absolutely mind-blowing anomalies that just shouldn't be there. <clears throat> and they're not on Earth. They are indeed on the planet Mars. And what it's telling me is that this ancient account of these beings living and working on Mars was 1,000% accurate, in my opinion, because I've got the photographic evidence at my fingertips. And anybody can look up these images. The second thing is when you read the account of the Ejiji, they were working on Mars doing uh, a lot of back-breaking labor for thousands of years. And they were doing it without any relief and without women. Uh, you know, they, these guys they wanted some women. They came down from Mars to Earth. These are the gods, these are the sons of God, I'm sorry, that fell to, uh, from heaven, in my opinion. So the sons of God that fell from heaven, they came to Earth. They were going to go to battle against Enki and Enlil, who were the kings of the Earth at the time, uh, before an agreement was made to... Uh, genetically modify an existing hominid on this planet and create a worker race. Now, after that agreement was made and the war, the talks of war had died down, these GG said, you know what, we're going to go back to Mars. We're taking some women with us. And so these are the sons of God that made it with the daughters of men as well. And they took some women with them back to Mars. So obviously there must be some compatibility between these, whatever hominid was here that was more like our cousin or homo sapien, pre-homo sapien, and them, because they took these women back, they made it with them, they sired children from them and everything else. And when you look at the, the data, the data doesn't lie on Mars. First of all, <clears throat> you can tell that Mars right now, currently, it has enough uh, geology to support life. And now, openly and admittedly, NASA has come forward and said the same exact thing. Uh, so right now, there's oxygen on Mars. Before, it was no oxygen, cold, dry rock. Now, all of a sudden, there's this extra oxygen, they can't discover all this oxygen is coming from all of a sudden. Uh, there have been 
acres and acres of lakes discovered. NASA did a press release, water coming out of the side of a mountain on Mars, and now they admit that there's literally billions of tons of liquid water on the surface of Mars as well. <clears throat> Originally, they were saying that because Mars doesn't have a, uh, a magnetic field with a rotating core, that it can't block uh, radiation from the sun properly, which means that people on the surface or they were living there, they'd be damaged by radiation. Now come to find out, everything is flipping, guys. Uh, because of the planet's uh, orbit uh, um, spin on its axis, which is about 23 hours, just slightly shorter than Earth's, uh, and its movement around the sun, its speed of its movement around the sun's axis, it creates something called bow shock. And this bow shock, uh, and along with a very weakened magnetic field, but our true, really, a magnetic field that does exist on the planet, combined with bow shock as it moves through space, bends and warps enough cosmic rays and radiation from the sun to allow life to exist on the surface without DNA damage from radiation, from radioactivity. So all of a sudden, all of these things are coming out. All this science is coming out now that Mars has a weather pattern, clouds, rain, dew. And also the fact that they were saying it was just a cold drop, that's now been um, washed away because the data comes from the REMS uh, uh, weather uh, uh, device there says that at the equator on Mars in summer, it's 99 degrees. <laughs> so as a matter of fact, there were two articles that came out three years ago when we had this extreme cold spell in North America in Detroit, in, uh, Detroit Michigan uh, and Indiana were so cold that the New York Times and a few other papers reported that it was colder in Detroit than it was on Mars at the time. So we see here that they're building up releasing the evidence little by little that Mars is habitable right now today, that people can live there right now today, especially if you build an underground shelter. Um, you know, so the, the evidence, and then also one other thing they came up with was that uh, when Elon Musk was talking a lot about taking 80,000 people to Mars, they released an article stating that, they meaning NASA, that the soil on Mars is better for growing crops than the soil on Earth. Okay, so... Now, that throws everything you saw in that Mars movie with Matt Damon out the window where he couldn't grow the crops unless he had them inside the enclosure and so forth. <laughs> no, listen, the soil on Mars is better for growing crops than the soil on Earth, which means you have everything you need there to, 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 to grow crops on Mars and I think abundantly as well. So, it's of an ancient civilization. I'm going to get into some of the evidence of what points towards that there, there may have been an ancient civilization on Mars and how it could be connected to Earth in some way. Uh, the, fourth, the first thing I want to point out is if it's really fascinating that if you do do research into what supposedly the Mars rover took for looking at different images around the planet, um, in some of them, there are these little glimpses of fossils, like ammonite fossils, showing in them. Now, whether or not that was actually an image taken from Mars or some other part of Earth is still up for debate. But either way, like what Billy was saying, Mars has this really um, mysterious past that shows that it was it's much different than what we've been told. And rather than millions and millions, if not billions of years ago, when life could have existed there, what if there was an event that was much more recent with that than that? And what if that event coincided and was perhaps related to one on Earth that also led to the destruction of a lot of different civilizations? Um, and I want to bring up two different concepts before we get into some of these Mars anomalies quickly so we can separate them into two groups, because I think it would be important for us to have these two concepts down. When you look at physics and you look at the different ways that different um, technology and different natural phenomena can lead to disasters and cataclysms that can be a planet-wide disaster or something that at least causes a mass extinctions. There really are two major categories that come into play here. And I guess some could argue three. If you were to throw in a comet or a massive asteroid strike, one could argue that. But let's put that aside for now and let's focus on because we don't really have um, evidence of necessarily one of those massive impact craters within a, a, a more relative recent time frame that could coincide with looking at the events of the Younger Dryas, like I talk about a lot, 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. But what we do have is we have evidence of two other potential disasters that I want to bring up. And those two categories are, are put into two places, either the sun 
some kind of a solar output or some kind of a nuclear impact. And so I want to discuss both of those and we'll present some of the evidence that's, that's shown on Mars that could help also paint a picture about possibly Earth. So on Mars and in, in, in within the Earth, we have these different cycles of solar output. You go from a solar maximum to a solar minimum and vice versa. And every time that happens, you get what's known as solar outburst or coronal mass injections as the sun goes through changes roughly every 12,000 years. So for those curious, there are three different categories for coronal mass ejections. They're known as C, M, and X mass ejections. And those are 10 times stronger than the one previous to them. And so it basically just explains the fact that there are coronal mass ejections are measured in a lot of different ways, and some of them can be minor to severe. And if a coronal mass ejection from the sun happens to face the right direction, it can basically obliterate a planet, especially if that electromagnetic field of that planet has already been weakened and that ozone has been weakened, weakened on that planet. So what I found interesting is if you read some of the articles that have been posted over the last week or two or even the last couple months, uh, there was an article by the Solar Dynamics Observatory who, that does di the direct monitoring of solar output on Mars that has stated that our sun is now in a solar um, change of going into a solar minimum. So we are in a solar minimum right now. But, but wait a minute. All over the newspapers for how many years now and everywhere, we're told that we're, this is the hottest time ever because of human activity and no mention at all about being entering into a solar minimum. Why? Why isn't that the top news? If, I, if I've learned that within our lifetime, our sun has gone from a solar maximum to a solar minimum, and there are earthquakes that are 200% what they've been in the last 20 years, and there are storms that are, are stronger than in recorded history going on, I would probably scratch my head and be like, wait a minute. How could that be connected to the fact that our sun within the last 20 years has gone from a solar maximum to a solar minimum? This should be big news, and it's not. It's sort of buried in the background. But yes, our sun is officially in a solar minimum, which is why we're seeing so many interesting changes right now. And it's right on par to 12,000 years during those actual civilization on Earth, where the sun was going through a change from a solar maximum to a minimum. And so uh, our solar minimum to a maximum, which is then leading into where we are now. So the other and this, so the other area I want to bring up is a nuclear disaster. Now, let's lay out some of the evidence for both and try and, and try to piece together what could have happened to Mars. Now, Billy, an area that I talk about a lot and that I think is fascinating is in 2012. And some people might know this. And if you don't, I would highly encourage you to research it. In 2012, there was a man named Dr. Brandenburg, who was a PhD from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, basically one of the smartest men alive, who his job was to design advanced rocket propulsion so that if you, you had to basically measure and, and understand what the layers are within the atmosphere of that planet of different molecules so that you could create a rocket that could successfully land and take off from it. Because if you don't have those equations exactly balanced, you can cause it to explode or not function correctly. So you literally have to study the planet's atmosphere and surface to understand what what kind of technology you would need to use to to get to it. And so what happened was Dr. Brandenburg is studying Mars because and and the uh, the moon, but specifically Mars because NASA and SpaceX they were there was a lot of talk about you know getting us up onto Mars and there was a lot of preparation that was being done especially from NASA at the time. And so what Brandenburg came up with which led him to later be fired and turned into a kook in modern society was that while he was studying the, the climate and the surface, he found extremely high levels of nuclear isotopes called xenon isotopes covering not only one area of the planet, but the entire surface of the planet, which is one of the major reasons why it's considered, it's called the red planet is due to these high levels of iron and these other isotopes that are found on the planet. And so what he came up with was, he was looking at the fact that there was what's called radioactive uranium found all around across the surface of the planet. And it's especially concentrated in a certain key area that we're going to get into. But that radioactive uranium, thorium and potassium that was found throughout the soil, basically Dr. Brandenburg came up with the hypothesis or at least the theory that 
it would have been impossible to create that type of chain reaction from a solar outburst burst alone. That there had to have been some kind of a nuclear reaction, some kind of a nuclear event to cause those particles to cover the planet. Billy, has your research come to that same conclusion? Absolutely. It has come to the same conclusion. We're talking about isotope Xeon-129, which is abundant on Mars in the atmosphere and in the soil, and it's leading and pointing to um, what would have been a extreme war uh, that extended maybe from Earth to the moon and even to Mars, maybe even beyond, as this galactic um, race of beings known as the Atlanteans went to wage war against each other. Uh, and I think that when you look at a lot of the space anomalies that we've seen and, and that we've discovered, you'll find that they look like they have been literally blown up. Everything looks like it's been, a flood has gone over the, the land and that also whatever was left was, was, was blown to pieces and you see uh, huge giant chunks of things that used to possibly fit together spread out along this blast potential blast radius of wherever the object originally was. And you see this consistently <clears throat> throughout the entire planet. So it's really interesting that you see uh, that there was a global flood. And also what, what's happened here, because of these massive explosions, these explosions, I don't think we even have a weapon that's that strong on Earth yet. This weapon could be the Astra weapon, okay, in my opinion. This could be the Astra weapon or the Brahma weapon talked about uh, in the ancient Sanskrit text that has the capability of destroying three worlds, any man on three worlds. These, 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 are, weapon, these weapons are planetary destroyers, kind of like the Death Star uh, from Star Wars. And I really do believe that this planet was hit with that, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, with one of these gigantic um, areas that were really, to me, gouged out by this weapon. Um, and it caused a pole shift of the crust of the planet itself. So Mars, just like Earth, has tectonic plates that uh, basically rub against each other and sit on top of magma and things like that. So they're capable of moving and shifting over time, over millions of years. You have an impact like what we see on Mars, uh, that caused potentially the pressure a lot faster almost instantaneously, causing the oceans to then flood and wash over everything on the entire planet, creating a global flood, so to speak. And uh, the weaponry that was used in this war I think the evidence of it, the signature of it, is all around the entire planet. Very well said, and, and I would agree. There's so many of these anomalies that we're about to get into to really paint a far different picture about not only the, our ancient past on Earth, but the ancient past on Mars. And I've talked a lot about in my work about how I do believe in just the theory that I've wrapped my, myself around is that what destroyed a lot of the lost civilizations on Earth was likely a, a coronal mass ejection, but I have not discredited that there may have been, there may be other players um, in this equation, possibly related related to some kind of a nuclear disaster. Because and when you have when you find in places like the Libyan desert of of the Sahara, when you find uh, glass has been formed from melted quartz, shocked quartz, there's only two ways that that can happen. You either have a that's why I, I would label these two types of cataclysms that have affected both Earth and Mars into two categories in leaving out um, things like an asteroid or comet strike. Because this melting of the quartz and rock, while it can be associated with comet and asteroid strikes, it's most commonly associated with melting from extreme heat. So either a coronal mass ejection or some kind of a massive nuclear out, uh, weapon that exploded. So that seems to be what is going to we we had to lump these disasters into, and that begs the question: Well, why aren't either of those things really even you really talked about? You know, why do we have something like the Younger Dryas only twelve thousand years ago in history that led to a dis, uh, extreme extinction of megafauna across the northern hemisphere and all these ancient civilizations? And none of that is talked about in books. It's blamed. Other things are blamed. Human activity is blamed. Every all these events in history that point to certain key factors that are related. The blame is shifted somewhere else, right? Oh, Mars. No, no, nothing like that happened there. It's just, you know, millions of years ago, something occurred. And yeah, maybe there was life there, but but nothing interesting, right? Whereas when you really start to look at these anomalies, you say that this was, you say, well, this look doesn't look like it was millions of years ago. If this coincided with obelisks, if there are, is evidence of obelisk-like 
pyramid-like structures on Mars that relate to Earth, then shouldn't they have overlapped? At least that inf the information for them should have overlapped. And that's why we're going to bring this down closer to home and look at what some of these anomalies may have caused. Now, I'm gonna go, we're going to go over a couple stats about Mars because Mars really is an amazing planet. You know, looking at it in a touristic, scientific kind of way, there are so many different anomalies on Mars, both natural and artificial, that are just absolutely incredible and mind blow blowing for those types of nerds that are like me with stats. And the first one I want to bring, I want to bring up a couple, and then Billy's going to expand on one of them. That's the most important. Now, for those who don't know, Mars has the highest mountain in the solar system, yet it's one of the smallest planets. That's what's so amazing about Mars. Mars is a terrestrial planet, which means it's mostly made out of rock. And on that planet is a mountain called that's been named Olympus Mons, and it is 72,000 feet high. For those who don't know, that is more than double the height of Mount Everest, which is absolutely amazing. amazing. And it's a giant shield volcano showing that Mars has a lot of extreme volcanism that's possible within the planet, which could get into how some of these disasters occurred. Now, the other one that is... Even maybe even in some ways more amazing than Olympus Mons as the height of that mountain, how big it is, is the fact that there is a canyon on Mars that Billy is going to expand on that is one fifth of the entire surface of the of the whole planet. Now, to put that in perspective, the Grand Canyon on Earth is 227 miles long and one mile deep, and that is considered one of the greatest wonders of our whole world. People f go from coming from all around the planet to go see that incredible canyon, and it is amazing. It is breathtaking to see that. But yet, on Mars, instead of 227 miles long, which is really impressive for a canyon, the, the, the canyon on Mars, known as Valles Marineris, is 2,500 miles long and 125 miles wide, six miles in depth, basically six times bigger than the one on Earth. Now, Billy... How can something like that be formed in a completely natural way? Or is it not natural? Yeah, you know, I do believe, based on my research of geology, uh, that this is not a natural formation on Mars. There are a couple of hypotheses that can lead to the creation of this, this monster of a valley that's here, this valley, uh, Valles Monaris, and this, this, um, this huge gouge that was taken out of Mars. One is when you read some of the ancient texts, you realize that there was a uh, another planet out there in the Enuma Elish called Tiamat. Now, at the time that Tiamat existed, Earth did not exist. Uh, and now, this Tiamat uh, we talked about in the, Enuma, in the Enuma Elish was about six to eight times larger than Earth potentially, water-bearing planet with solid mass land on it, and so there would have been uh, most likely Mercury, Venus which would have been in a position where Earth is at right now, which why Venus is considered Earth's twin. However, as it moves closer to the sun, uh, it uh, started picking up a lot more activity from the sun, which then created its kind of like um, its atmosphere that is now very dense, very hot. However, so imagine moving Venus into the location where, the, where, where Earth is now. And then outside of, outside of Venus, you would have had Tiamat, a gigantic, massive water-bearing planet with life on it that had two moons. One moon was the moon that we call our moon right now, which used to orbit Tiamat, and another moon, which is a habitable moon that looks like a planet called Mars. So Mars was a, in potentially uh, a habitable planet, and the theory behind this comes from tracking back the orbit of Mars around our sun and also analyzing the very strange elliptical orbit that it has you can see that in the Enuma Elysian, it talks about Tiamat being destroyed in a collision, a planetary collision of some sort, uh, that Mars may have been released into this very strange orbit, which can be reversed in time, backtracked, in other words, reversed, and you can figure out what happened. You can figure out that Mars was in that area, in that region, and then got released into this very strange elliptical orbit that it's in right now, which is very odd, because every two years is only the best time to travel to Mars from Earth, because that's when it's uh, in perigee, and you can get there in only three to five months, versus when it goes way out there, it could take you six months to a year, maybe more to get to Mars, depending on where you try to rendezvous because of its strange orbit. But again, this orbit was was slingshotted out after the planet that it orbited exploded. And according to the Enuma Elish, there's two di 
two concepts of why this planet Tiamat exploded. One is they depict these planets as uh, as gods, as sentient living beings going to battle against each other. So one hypothesis is that this was a galactic war and that a massive planetary weapon was used to destroy Tiamat for whatever reason. It's not very clear. The other is that it's just allegorical and that this was a planetary collision between a captured planet, uh, maybe a captured sun in our solar system, which we'll talk about later, that had a moon or planet orbiting it that collided with um, collided with Tiamat as it tried to obtain a very a more persistent orbit, which would have caused Tiamat to, to break up. Either way, according to the new list, the end result was Tiamat exploded and it became the asteroid belt, which to me makes a lot of sense. Now, a huge chunk of Tiamat swung away and recoalesced, swung away with all the waters and all the organic material on it for life, and recoalesced and became the Earth. As the Earth swung into this position, gravity and um, forces pushing Venus down closer towards the sun as it obtained its next uh, its next orbit range and, and, and solidified there, locked itself in there, uh, and maybe even pushed Mercury slightly closer to the sun as well, making it uh, you know a very, very hot planet. But uh, the... So what it, what it looks like to me is one side of Mars is extremely charred and the other side is extremely smooth when you look at a lot of the imagery. It could be that one side of Mars was facing Tiamat during this initial explosion and a lot of that debris hit that side of Mars causing a pole shift of the crust and a global flood. This could have been one of the very first of several catastrophes that happened to Mars because it looks like the pole on Mars shifted twice, not just once when you look at the geology of the of the of the continent of the uh, air region of where where this where this mass is where this gigantic valley is and also where they anticipated that the original equator used to be it looks like it shifted twice based on geology so it could be an explosion from Tiamat that caused the first pole shift the second could be Mars is called a god of war for a reason that there was this galactic war that did persist from the Earth to Moon to Mars there's a lot of evidence of weapons fire on different anomalies on the the moon and the, again, like on Earth, of course, we've got plenty of evidence on Earth when you look at different areas of the planet that have these um, massive stone blocks that look like they've been blown apart. Um, and, and so it looks like this war did persist, and uh, maybe this Brahma weapon was used to gouge this massive swath of territory out of Mars, creating a complete global catastrophe. And maybe right after Mars was just coming back to life and just rekindling itself and getting back in the game, this thing took it back out again, this weapon of mass destruction. And when you look at things in our solar system like Iapetus, which is a which is supposed to be a moon, but has a three mile high ridge going around it and looks eerily like a Death Star and maybe like an artificial technological device. You have to start thinking, is this Brahma weapon potentially real? And could that be one of the Brahma weapons that was being used in the ancient past? And is that what actually destroyed Mars? And when you analyze Mars and realize this Xenon-125 is in the atmosphere and in the soil everywhere, and then you just look at Earth and look at the same places where there's been records and accounts of these ancient wars, and you notice that they've all been turned to dust and sand, you start to say, wow, this is really bizarre. Um, it may be two disasters that happened on Mars over the course of several million years. I would agree with you on that. It seems like maybe the answer to Mars's past is not just one thing, but maybe multiple things. And I would, mm -hmm. I really do think that you're right about, um, for those who don't know, the Enuma Elish was one of the ancient tablets found in the Ashurbanipal Library in the late 1800s. And the Enuma Elish not only talks about the creation story of mankind with these Anunnaki gods that it specifically says states in there, but it goes on to, to talk about what seemed like this planetary battle. And, I think one of the best pieces of evidence that points to that is what we're going to get into with some of the pioneer data, because it seems to show that long ago in our past, and we don't even know how long ago that was, but our, our solar system may have got entrapped in another, and that may have been part of this battle with different planets trying to align themselves. And if you were to think of if a planet was it like, like a cosmic battle in terms of planets revolving around and, and having dominance over another based on their electromagnetic field and how they can sh um, in, enforce almost uh, basically proceed with certain kinds of 
powerful energy if one planet's a lot more powerful than another based on its gravitational field it can basically thrust one way out in another place it can have one crash into another planet and maybe that's one of the things that happened in our solar system was that we had an event like that in the past and that since then everything's become in a more more of a sync together and we don't see that kind of evidence but at the same time maybe there was also a war there like you said it seems like a combination of different effects came into the equation with trying to explain the disappearance of what may have been an ancient civilization but also the complete destruction of this planet um, and, that, and that's what we're going to get into some of the details of that to try to understand. Now, what I want to point on the screen is if you look at the image specifically on the on the right, the red planet that shows the, the United States with the gash of um, Vias Marineris trenched through it, you can see that not only is it the size of the entire United States alone, but notice how the western end of this um, canyon looks much, much different than the eastern end. What it looks like on the western end is some kind of a shock event occurred there. The ground is broken up into these massive pieces, like almost like a jigsaw puzzle where some massive impact occurred there, possibly a comet strike or an asteroid strike. But then again, there's no there's there's looks like there could be a crater near it, but we don't fully understand. But either way, that event seemed to have led to some kind of a massive outflow of water that traveled towards the east here and then you can see an opening where it looks like an outflow at the other end we don't we don't know what happened there because we're not being told the truth about the past there and what could have happened why are we not being the tr told the truth well that's the ultimate question because i think if this information was benign and it, it just helped us understand our solar system but didn't pre present connections to other things we'd be told the truth you know they would just tell us oh this is what happened but because it, it, they're not telling us and it's part of this deception and all this information that's being hidden, it means that it has to be connected in some way to our past and understanding what happened, because that would be the only reason you'd want to hide it. So whatever happened to Mars seems to have an impact on what happened to Earth, or at least points to the fact that there was, there was things going on there that are far different than we've been told. Now, as we move along to understand that better, some of the anomalies that have been seen on Mars to point to the fact that, hey, these are not natural anomalies that are seen there. There's got to be some kind of history to Mars that predates anything that we have that we've been told. Now, what you're seeing on the surface here is from the Viking probe that was launched in the mid 1970s to explore images from the surface. And this is before a lot of the corruption that existed within NASA. I would call in the 1970s and 80s, NASA was a lot more um truthful in some areas and others and i think based on the moon landing um with all the stuff that that went on with the moon landing in the late 70s and how in the late 60s excuse me and then how um there was so many cover-ups there it seems like it became more and more corrupt over time but early on there was there was there was an, an interest in seeing what was going on on mars and so they sent the viking probe there and they released these images to the public probably because they didn't expect that they would see this so in 1976, this image was released to the public, and immediately people jumped on board, seeing these very, very strange features on the planet. One of them was this face on Mars that sparked enormous groups of individuals seeking the truth about if there could have been an ancient civilization there. And then the other is what was known as this region of Cydonia, it was later called, with these pyramid-like structures with extremely sharp edges that seemed to be like some kind of a complex, some kind of an ancient complex with right ang right turn angles that looks very, very artificial, artificially created. So, Billy, what's your thoughts on this region of Cydonia, and do you think that these images taken by Viking, Viking 1 are... Um, are real or do you think that it's just uh, a way that we're viewing it and it's not actually uh, an, an, uh, an artificial surface i think that i think that these images are 1000 well, i keep using the term 1000 because that's how confident i am in some of the stuff i'm talking about <clears throat> excuse me so um when you analyze these images the time they were taken the angle that they were taken from you get the best uh overall view of this particular region of cydonia now, what's interesting is Cydonia, before I go on, Cydonia is the ancient name for Cairo, okay? So, um, not another coincidence, it's, it's, it's picked, that name Cydonia was given to this region for, for a pure reason, 
for, to, to this region for a reason. And that reason is that it's the synchronicity that it has with Cairo, Egypt on earth from ancient times. They know they, they're very well versed in all these ancient tablets and texts. They, they being the science, the NASA, the space agencies of the world, they research and study everything that me and you are studying and they know it very well. And uh, they're basing their exploration of space on these ancient texts. That's why they're going out to these places. Uh, but this area is definitely real. Now, much later, they went and flew back over again uh, in a different angle when there was darkness shining on this region. And they tried to say that the face was gone and all this other kind of stuff. And they passed through, passed the imagery through a, a two mass filter and all this other crazy stuff to alter it to make the face look like it was just a pile of dust. When in true reality, the face really is there. In my opinion, after doing a lot of research into the, into the Sumerian tablets, that face is the burial tomb of Alalu, who came to Earth from uh, Nibiru and discovered that there was gold in this region of space on both Mars and on Earth, predominantly mostly on Earth, because he had discovered that Earth was a piece of, or potentially a piece of, broken off of another planet that had a lot of gold, according to his ancient records that he had. Uh, but this region here is, is um, eerily reminiscent of a, a city from ancient, what we would consider ancient times on Earth. And the thing that's very interesting is if you go to the Avebury, UK, a region of, in, on Earth in, in, in Europe called Avebury, UK, and you download an ordinance map, you can go to Google and download the Avebury, UK ordinance map. You're going to get an ordinance map of this field out there, this massive area that has these anomalies on Earth that there were our man-made mounds and so forth that were built up from moving billions of tons of sand and, 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 um, and rock and building these massive structures right there in Avebury, right close to, um, really close to Stonehenge. But when you lay this ordinance map of Avebury, UK over the map of Cydonia and align the anomalies with the anomalies on this Cydonia image that you're showing right now, Matt, they line up perfectly. To the within a millimeter of each other, the angles are all there. The 19.5 degrees, the city's right on target. The the Tholus mound is right on target with the artificial mound at a very in the UK and face as well. Another that's built there. It lines up to the T. Uh, so it's really a, an amazing synchronicity between Earth and Mars. And you always see this situation here with our our remnants of ancient civilizations where they're always rebuilding things. Uh, to honor the gods or honor their relatives or, or, or honor people that they knew of from, you know, the distant past or their history. But somebody who had. Very yeah, that, that's right. And it's it just looks eerily representational of our own what we see as the Great Pyramid of Giza complex with yeah. this organization of structures that seems to be in, put in a very specific type of alignment in a very specific location. And. To me, one of the most incredible concepts to imagine was that if these if, if these civilizations were so advanced that they were on Earth and Mars and they had the same type of knowledge that was imparted and they were building these structures for a very specific reason, then why do we find them all clustered together that have the same anomalies if they're not artificial? How can we look at these images and look at some of these locations and look at the disasters that have happened on Mars and not start asking more questions? And one of those questions I think we, we have to add to this is we need to look at the nearest moon to Mars called Phobos. So for those who don't know, and Billy was talking about how Mars has a couple small moons, the two moons on Mars are Phobos and Deimos. And Phobos is of great interest to us because let's think for a moment about our own planet. Earth has its own um, satellite called the moon. And on our, our moon, when we went there, and uh, when we landed there and all this deception emerged, really, it's, I think it feel like it started because of the moon landing. And all the, the astronauts seeing all kinds of strange things and all kinds of footage disappearing and the dark side of the moon with all this stuff that popped up was so um, throughout history about how there's all kinds of secrets that exist there and we're not being told the truth about those places. Well, here we are on Mars with all these anomalies, just like on earth and on Mars on their, it's, it's biggest moon Phobos. We have the same thing. We find strange structures on Phobos that look extremely artificial. And now this is a little homework assignment. I would love if people did right now, go on your internet browser, 
I'll give everybody a second to do that. And go look up the Mars Global Surveyor images that were taken of the planet. So, uh, a lot of these are taken much more reason, recently, and they're extremely high resolution. And look up Phobos Monolith. Okay, type in Phobos Monolith on the Mars Global Surveyor. And you'll basically, what you're going to get is a high resolution image of Phobos. It'll allow you to look right down onto the surface of the planet with the utmost precision. And on Phobos, it's something that's become another one of these um, fan favorites like the face on Mars, you'll find that there is a, a very prominent what's called monolith on the surface, a structure that goes straight up into the air that presents this enormous shadow that comes off of it. Now, this primary monolith on Mars, to give people a, a little bit of statistics when they go look at it, this is it's 90 meters tall, which is about 300 feet. So it's the size of a building just for perspective. And if you look at the image that's taken almost looking straight at it, it has half of this monolith is almost perfectly uh, circular around it, like something that could not be created in nature. And then it looks like the other half is broken because it's got a straight line across it. Now, I say that because if you scroll down on that Mars Global Surveyor image to the south of that primary obelisk, there's another obelisk that can be seen south of it, but it's not broken. It, it has a, a much more um, – the structure itself looks, looks like it hasn't been as damaged. And the shadow on that structure, about the same size as the other one, is pointed, though, instead of having the angle that's different. And what does that tell me? It looks like an obelisk. It looks exactly like an obelisk, like on Earth. So if these structures that we're showing from the Viking probe in the Cydonia region look like pyramids, and we're seeing these obelisks, obelisk-like structures on Phobos and on Mars, it, it to me just presents more evidence to show that these structures we have on the planet, on our Earth, the pyramids of Giza and pyramids all around the world and these obelisks that were being created everywhere. Washington, D.C., the founding fathers had to create an obelisk. We see obelisks all throughout the Mesopotamia through Egypt, this this obelisk type of structure that seemed to be the obsession of a lot of these ancient cultures well we looks like we're finding those on mars too and to me that can't be a pure coincidence billy what do you think about briefly before we move on to the next one do you see the phobos monolith as being something legitimate that may be connected to these the Sidoni area oh absolutely uh, buzz aldrin made a very amazing statement uh, while he was talking about this monolithic football, he was on C-SPAN, um, I don't know how many years ago, maybe eight years ago or so now, but he was on C-SPAN talking about Phobos, talking about the very strange orbit that it has around the planet Mars, and talking about the fact that there was a monolith on Phobos and that people would be stunned to figure out who put that there. Uh, really amazing statement by former astronaut uh, Buzz Aldrin when I started analyzing Phobos and looking into it based off of that statement that I came across by Buzz Aldrin, I found out that um, there are two obelisks on this uh, this uh, moon called Phobos, that there was several attempts or have been several attempts to analyze the mass of Phobos by NASA and Russia, and they discovered that Phobos doesn't have enough mass to sustain its own orbit around the planet Mar Mars. So they're believing now that this Phobos may not be um, a geological boom, but might be an artificial construct, an artificial one. In other words, it may be kind of hollow on the inside, and whatever mechanism was uh, was in there allowing it to maintain its orbit is now turned off or not working right, and that eventually this Phobos will crash back down into the planet Mars uh, in the next several thousand years. It loses so many centimeters or millimeters per year in orbit. Uh, but the thing that's really amazing about it is the fact that they were saying that this scientist now, they're saying that Phobos is probably hollow on the inside. Then when you analyze a lot of the high resolution images of Phobos, which you can get them from NASA and Russia, you discover that it looks like weapons fire on the outside exterior of this moon. It looks, it doesn't look like normal craters. It looks like what you would see if you were to take a semi-automatic pistol or gun or a weapon, a beam weapon that had pulse, pulses coming out of it and, and shoot it on something. And when so when you analyze and really take a close look at Phobos from the outside, look at these high-res images, it looks like weapons fire. And then you have the very strange situation where Russia sent 
a mission to Phobos called Phobos 2. I think it was 19, um, it might have been 1988 that they launched and they probably got there by the end of the year. Uh, but this Phobos 2 uh, had a, ran into a strange anomaly, literally, as it was getting ready to um, you know, try to actually uh, take real close images, high res images of Phobos, this monolith and everything else. This object appeared that was in the shape of a gigantic UFO and it was so large it cast a shadow on the surface of Mars, this UFO shaped object, which is well documented and the images are public and have been public for a very long time. And at that at that moment, Phobos 2 uh, ceased to exist. So, um, yeah, it's uh, really interesting that uh, there's really something going on here that's that's almost like, you know, ready, ready to be put in a movie, a mainstream box office hit. This is some real crazy stuff going on. It's real. And regardless of that, scientists uh, have still, uh, you know, utilized the ability for them to raise trillions of dollars to head out there to, to Mars to, to continue to analyze it. And the reason why is because it's not a cold, dry rock and neither is Phobos. There's something very interesting going on there that I think the people of the world deserve to know. Yeah, I do too. And I like how you were talking about Phobos possibly being hollow and having some strange features about it. Because our, as maybe others don't know, but if they don't, I would highly recommend you research on it. Scientists have discovered Long, uh, quite a few years ago that when they were analyzing our the ratio of our moon to our planet, they could not find any other planet anywhere that had a pla our moon with the size ratio that our moon has to our planet, meaning that our, our moon is too big to be a satellite. That's a term used for a moon, a satellite of our planet. It seems more like it was something that was put there. Now, the other thing that's interesting, connecting what you said, Billy, is that this has done on trying to figure out what it's composed of. And one of those tests, what it did was to hit the moon with something to see what it sounds like. And when they did that, they were absolutely shocked that, and there's, there's many scientists that have come and have claimed this, and some of them have even been looked at it, frowned on, but they, they swear that it rang like a bell when they did that. It rang like a bell. Like there was, there was, it was hollow inside. So what is going on with our moon? What is going on with Phobos? What is going on with the relationship that those have? And is it all connected? Well, for those who are skeptical, um, there was so much outpouring of people curious about this face on Mars that it became uh, uh, basically um, a movement, I guess you could say, of people seeking truth about Mars. And so what did, what did um, NASA do? They said, okay, Let's make people, let's show them the truth. And they, in 2001, they send the Mars orbiter back to the same place that the Viking probe had been in 1976. And they took these high resolution shots and they said, see, look, the face on Mars is nothing. It's just a mountain. There's nothing there. But here's what's so odd about it. The first thing that, that is odd is that look at the shadow that's present on the, the original face on Mars from the Viking probe. Look at how defined the features are. Not only is there that defined shadow, but there's defined features that would exist even if there wasn't a shadow. So let's say, for instance, the Viking probe had taken that image of, of the face in 1976 from a different angle in a different time. Even if that shadow had been a different place, those features that exist there would still be the same. I mean, it's undeniable that there is a face there. And, and it, that face would have been impossible to create in that perfection. We're not talking about some... Natural stone foundation, like for instance, I, I live in Maine and in a state next to me called New Hampshire, the, the icon for New Hampshire up until recently and still is, was what's called the, the Man of the Mountain. And it was up at Profile Lake, there was a big cliff that hung off it that looked like from the side view, it just happened to look a little bit like a face. And so the state adopted it and eventually there was uh, an event that occurred with a, a storm system event and the face fell. It was being held up and it fell down the ground. Everyone got all sad and freaked out because it no longer looked like a face anymore. Well, those types of features that if you look at them, they never really look exactly like a face. You know, and it kind of looks like one, but this looks like a very specific type of design to look like a, a type of hominid face. Now, so what happened? Well, Mars went back and took pictures and they said, hey, look, there's nothing there. Well, to me, something had to have happened. And I want to get Billy's thoughts on what may have happened, but 
it looks like to me, Billy, that structure was altered. What do you say? Oh, yeah. It looks, oh, altered. Yeah. It looks altered in two ways. It looks altered in one way with the way that they took the second photo with the you know ability for uh, photographers or uh, photography to um, modify and alter filters onto an image. And also looks possible a second way to me, like they may have sent a rover to this thing. And just my opinion, this is no fact, but my own theory, my own opinion, to destroy this object, to maybe ride a, a remote controlled rover up inside of it and maybe detonate something to collapse its roof, to take away the features so that people can stop talking about it and people can stop thinking about it. There were TV shows coming out. There were movies coming out. There were all kinds of stuff talking about the face on Mars and the fact that we're not alone. <clears throat> and they realized this was going to get out of hand. And if they, if this face is real, which they, they probably knew it is, was, uh, that it can raise too many questions as to our origins and lead back to Iraq being the cradle of civilization and that the Sumerian cuneiform tablets that we have been, have been discovered hundreds of years ago are telling the truth all of a sudden that changes our perspective on reality, on spirituality, on religion, on economy. All these things could collapse. And I think the powers that be for one main reason on top of all is that they would not allow, wouldn't want uh, uh, historical Arabs to be, uh, have that role, have such a huge role in the story of mankind in this current era. Just my personal opinion. But I think that they destroyed this thing um, from the ground level. Yeah, it, it's because it, look, I mean, it's is it just a, is it a, is it really my schools of thought come into only two places that make any kind of sense? Either one, this face on Mars still looks like this, but they doctored the image, or two, what is more likely a plausible scenario based on what Billy says is I think that they did just it. Well, let's analyze for a couple things that point to that. Take a look at that right side image from 2001 from the Mars Orbiter Probe. Look at some of the collapse, like Billy said, especially on that right side. You can see fracturing that looks like it occurred on the structure all along the periphery of, I would say, the, the, the first third of the structure itself along the edge. It looks like something massive blew the whole thing away and it sort of collapsed on itself in a rubble pile like I said, within it. So maybe maybe that's the evidence of, like for what Billy said is, because if it was shot from like a new, some kind of a weapon from outside, you would think that debris would be all over the place. I mean, and they would know that. They're not stupid. NASA's not stupid. They realized that, oh, wow, so if people saw a debris pile littering all around the structure, clearly they would start asking questions. Well, what doesn't ask questions? Going inside it and imploding it and having it collapse on itself, they would, be, they would just say, hey, look, it was just a pile of rock, and hey, based on the type of angle and the sunlight and all the shadows, it did look like a face, though, but see, it's not a face anymore. And then mm -hmm. a, a large group of those people will say, damn, I really thought that was something. And then they move on with their life, life and they never look at it again. And boom, those people that were on the path of seeking theories and hypotheses in different areas just stop all of a sudden they're done because – what they th were so sure about is no, it just, Hey, look, it's nothing. Right. And I think that was a powerful moment in some of the movements here on, 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 I guess you could say the, the capability and what is willing to be done to hide the truth. And the truth must be big enough to connect to so many different things that they're willing to go to those kinds of lengths. Now, speaking of secrets, Billy, we're going to move beyond Mars and we're going to get into a little bit of um, a little bit of history of our solar system and some of the secrets that aren't being told. And some of these things that are we're about to go over may play a big role in some and some of the events that have gone on with Mars and Earth's history. Now, the first thing I want to bring up is that okay, so we're told this doctrine of our solar system, and then I want to reiterate what that doctrine is, and then we're going to move on and explain some of the evidence that point to some points to some other. Uh, pieces of pieces of facts that have come up. We have eight planets in our solar system now. There used to be nine. Of course, this is the doctrine. There used to be nine, but Pluto was demoted after they they realized that they didn't think it was a planet anymore. Okay, so we have eight planets according to mainstream um, thought processes. Do it now. 
But that's not what some of the evidence that's come out over the past has shown us. It's shown us that there may be a much more complex history to our solar system than just what you're what you're seeing here. And that comes along with the discoveries that have been made with the Kuiper Belt, a massive asteroid and comet belt field that exists beyond Neptune. And that's why I wanted to show this image. Because we think of what's what we commonly think of as the inner solar system, but there's a lot else that exists in our outer solar system as well that plays a role in this. And it has to do with the effect that a body has on something else based on its electromagnetic field. And those types of interactions can be far more um, impressive, even over greater distances than we might realize. And that's going to be getting into whether or not there are secrets that we're just not being told about. And some of those secrets were starting to be revealed in 1992. And that's where all of this starts. And so for those who don't know, in 1992, NASA started to get curious about why there was these abnormal anomalies to the, um, basically the rotation in how the planets, the elliptical orbits there were shown on Neptune especially. Here we have all these planets moving around in our solar system based on the sun, but something very odd is going on with Neptune. Neptune was spinning completely different on its axis and presented this massive elliptical orbit that, that, that was providing evidence to show that something was impacting it from far away and causing its orbit to be strange in this long elliptical form. So what was causing it? And that was the entire purpose behind them spending millions and millions of billions of dollars on this new mission called the Pioneer Mission. And I thought, I thought that was a great name because they were so – confidence confident in the fact that they were going to discover some new anomalies that were going to shed light on us understanding our solar system but instead what was found was so incredible that it caused the complete opposite reaction and it caused this clamping down on information and deception to be created after especially the 1990s yeah there was deception about the moon but it really ramped up and ramped up in the 90s with i think just more power being influenced into science and more power from outside entities and individuals of great power into our establishments to say, look, you've stumbled upon something you're not supposed to. And you, you this, this is not something that we're allowed to be told to the public. And what is that? Well, when they sent these probes out, they were sending it out based on the data that, and I quote, in the press, in the press, um, that, press briefing that was given in 1992 nasa gave this this statement be, to give justification for what they had essentially had found is based on the pioneer probe data which was later the decision had been made obviously to clamp down and, and cover all this up but before that was done this is the statement that they made to society and as part of this new news briefing they said and i quote Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond seven billion miles from the sun. So they knew. They knew all about this. The Pioneer data came out. They discovered it. They realized that there's something out there that is in, it's impacting and having an effect on our entire solar system and probably even our, our sun. And so what happened? Well, they went out and they sent out the Pioneer Pioneer 10 and 11 to discover what might have been out there. And Pioneer 10 found something, didn't it, Billy? Yes, it did. Um, you know, people have been told that we've been living in uh, you know, a solar system that has one sun. Well, that's wrong, guys. We live in a binary solar system. Um, we, we, we now have um, discovered that there is another body out there in an area, in a region of space um, called the inner Oort cloud. And in this inner Oort cloud area, we have discovered that there is a round dwarf star that has objects orbiting it. So there's a brown dwarf in our solar system, which is the sun that has the same mass almost as our yellow sun in terms of weight and mass, but the, um, the brightness is deeply reduced because the star doesn't have enough nuclear fusion to burn bright and as hard as our yellow star does. However, it does have gravitational waves which do generate friction and heat on anything that orbits it and whatever it orbits, and it orbits our sun. 
So what's really interesting is that this brown dwarf, which has planetary bodies orbiting it, and what's interesting is you can look up, look this up. You can find it now online. Mainstream astrophysicists, mainstream astronomers, and even the mainstream news have now brought this to light, that there is an inner Oort cloud object. They call it another solar system within our solar system that's orbiting our sun. They, cl they claim every 4,200 years. The Sumerians say around 3,600 give or take a few hundred years pretty much in the same vicinity and it does orbit our sun and this would explain why we have a speed up of the precession of the equinoxes as we move into a gravitational orbit between our yellow sun and its brown dwarf so we have to obtain breakaway speed uh and what's interesting is another another problem that this this other uh object has caused is gravity from it the gravity waves that come from this brown dwarf interact with all of the planets and uh and moons in our solar system and it has caused in my opinion it, it is the cause for the global warming that has swept through the entire solar system not just earth earth is not the only place that is experiencing global warming there's global warming on the moon our moon directly above our heads has liquid water on it. Yes, liquid water is on the moon, guys. In case you didn't know, it's not a giant, cold, dry, dusty rock. There is liquid water and a very thin atmosphere on the moon as well. This is real science. Uh, but there's more liquid water now than normal as the moon is warming. Uh, Mars is warming. The ice caps have melted. There's billions of tons of flowing water now. The scientists said that the state believe, according to their probe data, that the core of Saturn is so hot that it seems like it's melting. If, Earth, if, if it was Earth, we'd be done already. So this global warming uh, is moving through the entire solar system, and it is, in my opinion, a direct result of this, this cycle of the orbit of this brown dwarf that has planets orbiting it, which could have potentially, potentially, Nibiru talked about in the ancient past orbiting it. I don't think that Nibiru is a planet that floats free by itself. I think it orbits a sun, and its sun could be a brown dwarf. And one of the things that clued me to this was the uh, the ways that the Anunnaki described the brightness of our sun on this planet. And so in order for the sun to be so bright that it would irritate them, and when you look at some of these skulls that have been left behind, some of these elongated skulls with only one parietal plate on them, which means they, they weren't homo sapiens, it appears that they have gigantic eye sockets. And if you came from a place where light was significantly dimmer, you would have huge eye sockets, and if the planet had more mass, which potentially happens, uh, you would have stronger physiology. Your bone structure would be akin or grown under the gravitational field of a bigger planet, which means you would appear to be a Superman on this planet. Just like if we go to Mars right now, us humans go to Mars, we can pick up gigantic boulders the size of cars and throw them. We can jump and dunk on a 20-foot basketball hoop because we grew up with the density and gravity of, uh, of this planet Earth, which is larger, much larger than Mars itself. Uh, so it's just really it's an amazing story. Uh, we do live in a binary solar system. Uh, there are inner Kuiper belt, or what they call them, sorry, let me take, give you the exact terminology. There are TNOs, trans-Neptunian objects, where they found now, uh, let me see, let me give you the total number so I give you the exact number. There's the European Space Agency discovered 132 worlds inside our solar system. Let me say that again, guys. The European Space Agency, this is on the ESA.INT website, the European Space Agency website. The European Space Agency discovers 132 worlds inside our solar system. This is inside the Oort cloud. So in the inner Oort cloud region of our solar system, there's another 132 planet-sized bodies or subplanet sized bodies but massive enough that they have gravitational fields massive enough that you can you can rendezvous with them and land on them some of them are very large some of them are small the series it's very interesting that matt showed that um that mainstream uh version of our solar system and one planet is missing there as well and that's c-e-r-e-s it, it it's right after mars so you have you have mercury venus earth Mars, and then you have another planet called Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, which ironically has the most fresh water than any, than, than even Earth uh, in our solar system. Very small planet, uh, but when they flew by it, 
a couple of years ago, the lights were on and they were saying that uh, <laughs> that there was just ice particles glinting from the sun. But then when they got to the dark side, the lights were on again and there was no sun. So uh, I think there's life all throughout this entire solar system. But I really do believe um, for the topic we're talking about right now that there is a another uh, sun in our solar system and orbits our star. We live in a binary, which is very common in space. And the last thing I want to tell them about, Matt, real quick, is when we look at the Enuma Elish and we hear about this planetary battle where these planets are struggling to get their own orbits and their gravitational fields are are, are crashing into each other and, and moons are crashing into planets and all this stuff is going on while the, while the solar system tries to or orientate itself and get some peace and some calm. Uh, when you analyze the most recent science data coming out of astrophysics, you discover that our solar system is not from the Milky Way galaxy. This is important, guys, so listen to me what I'm telling you. Our solar system originates from a place from another galaxy called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. Not the Sagittarius constellation. There's two different things. But the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy is being consumed as we speak right now still. It hasn't been completed yet by the Milky Way galaxy. And the exact intersection point where our solar system is exactly and precisely located out in this galactic arm is where you'll find us. And we came from the Sagittarius Dwarf and the Milky Way is swallowing up, still in this particular moment, swallowing up. And that amazing swap across the sky, if you're looking from a very dark place with no, um, uh, no, no, no less city lights, uh, no light contamination, you'll be able to see Sagittarius uh, in an arch across the sky. That's where we're actually from. So we are, so our solar system is an alien to the Milky Way galaxy. And also the reason why I bring it up is because it would explain this very strange epic of the Enuma Elish talking about all these planets and moons trying to gain orbits, fighting bond for position to orbit our sun. It would explain that this tale could be a true story talking about the merger um, of the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy with our Milky Way galaxy, putting our solar system right here where we are. Well said, Billy. And I, th I think what you said about the Enuma Elish is, is pretty accurate. It, there seemed to be some kind of a major event that occurred with our solar system with another solar system. And that mm -hmm. might seem crazy to some people, considering what we've been told in our Rockefeller history books and of you know our solar system and what we have all around us just in terms of understanding what's you know we look at traditional encyclopedias and we try to get an understanding of everything okay this is this way this is that way what we've been told about our solar system is um very inaccurate and in, and in many ways very deceptive and i think that's where i'm going to go here is i want to provide some evidence behind this i want to provide some facts so we can talk about this in a way where we can say hey look this isn't just someone's opinion saying this. There's real evidence that could, that's backing this up, and it's part of something much bigger that a lot of people don't know about. So where did this whole thing start? I want to provide a little bit of evidence. This is something I've talked about a couple times, but I think it's ex incredibly important because, in my opinion, if some if if some researcher out there puts themselves um, their research first above everything else they've done, and they sacrifice their time and energy being accosted from society to truly point out what is the truth and to have their lives end in a tragic way and have them be buried in the history books. It, to me, there's nothing worse. When you sacrifice your yourself to for truth, to uncover something, and then you subsequently become forgotten, to me, there's almost no tr greater tragedy. And so that's why I continuously bring up heroes of our past, like two men in particular, Thomas Van Flanderen, Flanderen and Robert Harrington. So I want to provide a little bit of background because this whole story begins with them. In the 1980s, Thomas Van Flanderen, who was an American astronomer and scientist, he's one of these guys that was, you know, top of the line, he's one of the smartest people you'd ever met, you know, who's at the top echelons of the scientific world. He just happens to be more open-minded and he was looking at some of these ancient records talking about what might have happened in our solar system he's looking at data from uranus and neptune he's scratching his head saying something doesn't add up something is going on in our solar system that is not the way we think it is 
there's some massive interaction going on out there that's that's beyond more than just some, one little planet flying by. Billy mentioned all those planets, exoplanets, moons that ex, that they've added up now over over a hundred. Those are all out there rotating around, but it's not just one individual of these types of planets that seems to be causing this as something bigger, like another solar system. That's the kind of scale that we're talking about. So Th Thomas Van Flander, he starts to question everything, and he gave a great quote, which is one of these quotes that I love to read because I feel like it really sums up just basically everything that Billy and I talk about. It sums up everything that, to me, connects what the truth is in the, in the, in the, the journey to find truth. And he, he says, and I quote, Events in my life caused me to start questioning my goals and the correctiveness of everything I had learned in the matters of religion, medicine, biology, physics, and other fields. I came to discover that re reality differed seriously from what I'd been taught. So what happens? Thomas Van Flander becomes obsessed with this. He sees all this data and he knows there's something else out there. So he gets in contact with a man named Robert Harrington, who was the chief astronomer at the U.S. Naval Observatory. So he's a highly prominent figure, just like Thomas Van Flandern was, but they happen to be buddies. So Flandern calls him up on the phone. He says, hey, Robert Harrington. Hey, Robert, you know, I got all this data here I'm trying to figure out. I really need some of your assistance at the, at the Naval Observatory to, to work with me here. Robert Harrington says, okay, what do you got for evidence? What do you got for data? So Thomas Van Flandern lays the whole thing out for him, and he completely blows Robert Harrington's mind. Robert Harrington didn't even know anything about these anomalies because, remember, he's part of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. He was the head chief astronomer at the Navy Observatory. So he was one of these guys that has all these individuals below him, and he didn't know about these strange anomalies. So Van Flandern lays the whole thing out for him. And they both become on this mission to go find out what exists in our outer solar system. And what they start doing is they start going to certain key points of planet. Where he can travel all down to the southern tip of New Zealand. And he is trying to observe different perspectives that can see these other places in our outer solar system that we can't see in where most population centers are due to light pollution and also angles and all these different things. And he observes this planetary body and potentially something much greater beyond it. And he starts getting all excited because he sees that this planetary body, body that he observes, it's not an exoplanet. It's four to eight times the size of Earth. Remember that quote that I gave from NASA, gave in the press arranged um, in 1992? That's based on Robert Harrington's work. He's the reason why they came up with the four to eight times the size of Earth, because he found it. He saw that it was out there and that it was it was having an interaction with our inner solar system and the Kuiper Belt. But what does that mean? Well, he knew that if there was a giant planet out there, that it wasn't just a rogue planet, it had to be connected to something bigger. And that's why he was searching for this other binary star. And that's where this whole thing begins. So what evidence do we have that existed? Well, Thomas Van Flandern and Robert Harrington mysteriously died right after that research in the 1990s. They died of throat cancer, just like so many of these other researchers that mysteriously died either from suicide or some kind of a cancer where, oh, they were they're unexpectedly sick and they die and people move on. But these two individuals, and I can't believe that something like this would happen to some of these high profile figures. But you know, maybe I can if you look at things like Kennedy. I mean, I guess nobody is, is out of bounds of, of this type of information. Um, and so what happened? Well, the smoking gun for evidence to point to connect to this whole thing that Billy is talking about with this binary star system was found in 1987. And this is something that, again, I talk about frequently, but it's one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most important pieces of evidence that's ever been let out to the public that, it, that pertains to anomalies and, and information about our outer solar system. Probably the most important smoking gun piece of evidence. Now, I mentioned encyclopedias early on. Cyclopedias were was the place that you would go before the Internet. When you wanted to learn about something, you would get an encyclopedia, and you would look up the topic in the index, and then you would read about it. Well, in 1987, an extremely important volume of encyclopedias called the Science and Invention Encyclopedia, highly prominent at the time, they, they, they came out with a blunder. Somebody didn't get the memo about this giant cover-up because they released 
their version, and it contained incredible evidence to point that our, our solar system is actually a binary star system with another solar system that seemed to get trapped within it, which would explain the entire thing, the presentation that we've been going into about how the Enuma Elish explains these planetary cataclysms and that a lot of this stuff, how this stuff might have happened and why these cycles of destruction keep occurring with our sun. Is is this interaction between this other binary star having a playing a role? Maybe. Now, let me provide um, some of the evidence for what it says. So in the 1987, and I, I'm going to say this slowly so that people can go look it up, because and I have um, information in my book, The Stage of Time, as well as on a lot of my videos, I present this as well. But I want people to be able to go online and see it for themselves. So go look up the 1987 New Illustrated Science and Invention Encyclopedia and look up volume 18, page 2488. And I want people to go look because it's absolutely amazing. And what it shows on that is it gives this description of what the pioneer probes found. Remember I told you that NASA and Robert Harrington and Flander were all concerned about what was going on with Neptune and Uranus. They knew something was affecting it. So that's why they sent out the pioneer probes. So pioneer Pro in the 1980s. So pioneer probe 11 didn't find anything, but pioneer probe 10, and that's what this diagram is, it found the great secret of our solar system to explain everything. And so what it says in a small little quote, and this is all it says to explain these incredible diagrams in this encyclopedia. It says, Pioneer 10 became the first craft to pass into interstellar space in 1983. The diagram shows the path of the two Pioneer probes. That's it. One of the greatest discoveries in our entire um, existence of a human species, finding another binary solar system in, in our star system, and it's and it's they don't even talk about it. Like all that information was cut, but somebody left in the diagrams. Like, oh, here here it is, and this is an an actual image from the encyclopedia. You can see the left of the screen, page two thousand four hundred eighty-eight. And look at this diagram for a minute, because what I want to point out on the bottom left, I'm starting. Look at how it shows Earth. It shows Uranus and Neptune specifically there like they're looking at how those are the outer planets and how they're affected. And then look at Pioneer 10, how it traveled off, and what did it find? Boom. It unequivocally discovers through its the telemetry data that it can it can get off of what they put up, they because they put infrared data because they know that planets, broke planets, and bodies out in space are not lit up because they have nothing to light them up. So there's only the only way to find them is to use infrared to, to see their heat signatures, okay? And so what does it find? It finds a 10th planet which would now be called Planet Nine or Planet X because of the demotion of Pluto. And, and 19, in 1983, this planet was 4.7 billion miles from Earth or from the Pioneer 10 probe. Then what did they find? Mm -hmm. Far more impressive. They found a, what was called a dead star. Now, Billy, I want you just to comment, comment on this for a minute because you call this a brown dwarf star. Wouldn't that mm -hmm. be what a dead star mm -hmm. is? Yep, that's exactly what it is. It's a brown dwarf star. It's a dead star. It's a failed star. In other words, it didn't ignite fully into what we what we consider a, a white star like ours. We get you know, with light fractals. We we get it looks yellow, but it's really white. Um, and uh, the the thing about it is, it has almost the same amount of mass. So gravitationally, it's just as powerful. It's just that it didn't expand out the fusion didn't ha happen in the same exact way that our, our sun had nuclear fusion, uh, but it can sustain, and in my opinion, uh, it can sustain orbits and it can, it can sustain life. Because if you have uh, a planet orbiting a brown dwarf star with that amount of mass, the planet and the star are gonna have a gravitational battle every moment of every day. And that tug of war battle as that planet orbits that brown dwarf is gonna create friction as the body of the planet and that star basically squeeze and expand. And that squeezing and expanding, and that creates a friction, which generates what? Heat, okay? Just like when you put food in the microwave oven, the reason why your food gets hot is because the microwaves shake the ato actual atoms in your food, and those atoms shaking around like that, that friction creates heat. The same exact thing happens with a planet. The heat's from the inside out, just like the microwave oven. So you get that internal source of heat which then can power weather systems because you need internal heat 
to power a weather system. So uh, I think that this this brown dwarf, uh, is, which is what they call a failed star, can sustain life no matter what. And the reason why we can't see it from Earth is because two reasons. One, it's so far away. And number two, because it is a brown dwarf, you would have to go into anybody on this live can go to worldwide worldwidetelescope.org, worldwidetelescope.org, and you can go to two mass infrared mode. You have to go to infrared to be able to see this because it's so dim. And then look towards uh, out just outside the constellation of Leo and start zooming in. You'll find a brown dwarf out there with planets orbiting it. Yeah, it, it's amazing. I mean, talk about a discovery, right? What kind of interaction would a binary star system have from one that didn't have that? I mean, we, when we're taught in school that we, our sun is the only star in our solar system and that everything else revolves around it, what would have happened if you had an entirely other binary star system that interacted with it? Now, I want to give some statistics for people who might think that's weird. If you look into data about star systems that have binary suns, meaning more than one, more than 80% of all star systems they've, they've studied all have binary stars to them. So it's, it's very common to have that happen. Now, Billy, I wanted to get your take on this before we move on and, and end out the show and take questions. But just lastly, if something is a dead star, and this is something that I talk about at the end of the stage of time, I postulate in, on the, the theory that if it's a dead star as it's shown, because they know that based on observing and having less fusion, does that mean that it's older because it's now lost its fusion? And would that mean that this solar system is potentially much older than our own? Oh, yeah. It could oh, mean yeah. that this star yeah. is out of fuel and became a brown dwarf. There's a couple of theories about brown dwarfs or red dwarfs. There's two names that were given to these, brown and red dwarf. Uh, the particular exact difference between why they give it those two different names, I'm not quite sure at this particular moment. However, uh, just like you can have a white dwarf as well, which is like Sirius B, uh, there in the triangle, uh, which the, the Dogon knew about long before we can even find it. You also have the situation here where we have this red dwarf or this brown dwarf floating through our solar system. And... Uh, I believe that it could be, it could possibly be a star that either failed to ignite, or maybe it began to, it didn't have enough energy to sustain for the billions of years like our star, or maybe it did, but it's just now running out of fuel. Meaning that, like you say, how old is this solar system? Where, where was this brown dwarf or this red dwarf captured from, and how old is that? And how old are the, is the planet? Are the planets, I should say, because they look like to be about maybe six orbiting it. Uh, you know, and when you look at the ancient texts and you realize that these beings came here approximately 400 to 450,000 years ago, to have that technology, to be able to do the things that they did and the way that they did it and to cultivate an entire solar system and maybe even beyond, they may have been at least, uh, you know, 500,000 to a million years ahead of us. And you just look at where we came from just within 100 years from horse, buggy and carriage to now putting remote control cars on other planets. And now we have probes that have left, left our solar system and the Oort cloud completely, I believe. So we're in a, a age right now where we can see, wow, we're moving towards the same level of advancement. And even with all of the, uh, the suppression that we've had, we still move forward. I mean, that, you know, so uh, progress is inevitable. It's just a part of the rise and fall of civilizations, no matter how, how hard we tried to hold it down or how hard they tried to hold, hold it down. It still seems as if we're going to progress no matter what, uh, you know. So it's just really amazing, man. It's really, we, the, the true age of this solar system is probably incalculable. We're probably way off. And I truly believe on a la my last note is that when we dig into a lot of these underground mines, these coal mines and these different gem mines and so forth, and we go down so many layers into the earth, and then the miners come up with tools and they come up with pottery. And they come up with strange anomalies that date back hundreds of millions of years. And then we go, wait a minute, human beings are only 200,000 years old. So where did this stuff come from? My own theory on this, and it's something that I'm working on now uh, with a, another uh, a book, is that uh, maybe, you know, this will be in the book that me and Matt write. We're going to talk about this, Matt. We're going to talk about the fact that when Tiamat exploded, and the, a huge chunk swung away and became the Earth, it's quite possible during the recoalescence period 
that a lot of the advanced materials and artifacts that were there that survived are now being pulled out of deep uh, mines on the earth and that they're not here because we were here 500 million years ago, but that they are there because a, a civilization that existed when we were part of another planet uh, had them there, and now they just, um, you know, through the coalescence of the planet becoming Earth, we have now discovered them again de de in deep, deep in the rock. Yeah, we certainly have a lot of um, incredible truths that are being very, very well hidden from us from a, a, such a wide spectrum. It's amazing that individuals like you and I are just labeled as conspiracy <laughs> theories and that you're not allowed to believe anything that's outside of the box of what we're told. And yet, time and time again, whether or not it's everything from our, our own geoengineering and chemtrails to a binary star system or ancient texts and lost civilizations to ancient technology they had, no matter what it is, from a wide spectrum, leading back to understanding who we really are, our past, the past of our solar system and how everything is interacting, this seems like there's countless secrets that are being held back from society to not know. And, and we have these little tiny breadcrumbs that keep getting released about them where, you know, groups like Caltech will come along and say, oh, wow. Hey, look, all those crazy theories about Planet X when people were considered crazy conspiracy guys. We're actually finding data that's supporting those planets and those objects beyond the Kuiper Belt based on mathematical equations. Oops. That stuff is out there, but yet all these things have been buried and those individuals who I consider heroes have been thrown under the bus to have their contributions mean nothing. And I think that's what's so important about researchers like you, Billy, and I, and many, many others that are willing to come out and say, hey, we're going to put ourselves on the line to preserve truth and explore truth because you know we don't have everything perfect there's a lot of things that we may not have right but at least we're out there objectively exploring truth and trying to find out what's real